Welcome to this episode of the Voice of Victory podcast, recorded live at the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We hope the message today from Pastor Chris Nolan is a blessing to you. Before you begin listening, we invite you to grab your Bible and follow along. Now, let's join Pastor Chris. And the scripture tells us that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. God said you're going to make it. Amen. He's got this. Whatever you're going through in your life, whatever you're facing, whatever you're burdened with today, you can rest assured that it's going to be okay. Amen. Because you are safe in the palm of his hand. If you take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter number 2 is our text this morning, verses 13 through 20, as we continue our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We began in chapter 1 uh, by looking at how Paul remembered the church at Thessalonica, and he remembered their work of faith and their labor of love and their patience of hope that they had in the Lord Jesus. We also saw how the gospel came to the church at Thessalonica. It came not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and with much assurance. We also talked about how that we are to be followers of the Lord. And the Apostle Paul talked about the importance of discipleship and how we need to have people in our lives that uh, that we follow, that we pattern our lives after as, as they follow Christ, and that every believer needs someone that is mentoring them, and also every believer should have someone that they are mentoring. And so we saw the importance there of being followers of the Lord in verse 6 through 10 of chapter 1. And then as we got into chapter 2 last week in verses 1 through 12, uh, we saw Paul's defense of the gospel. And he talked about how he ministered to the church at Thessalonica and how that their work was not in vain and how that uh, they endured the suffering and the persecution in the midst of all that they went through. They stayed faithful to preaching the gospel. Paul mentioned that he was there not to please men, but to please God. And he was encouraging the church to stay on point and to not get distracted and to stay focused on their mission and on their purpose. As we come to verses 13 through 20 of chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, we see the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel. Notice what he says beginning in verse number 13. He says, For this cause... Also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in the presence, not in heart, Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Let us pray. Father God, as we open up your word this morning, we are encouraged as the choir sang beautifully that God said that we're going to make it. Whatever storm, whatever trial, whatever situation in life that we endure, we know that all things work together for good to those that love you. God, we thank you that you've given us your word as our guide. We thank you for giving us the scriptures to teach us and to guide us in our lives. 
And Father, as we open up your word this morning and we look at the glory of the gospel, as Paul mentions here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. And we pray that your word would not return void, but it would accomplish what you desire for it to accomplish today. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there is nothing more glorious than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more beautiful. There is nothing more important. There is nothing more crucial than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why we need to partner with ministries such as the Gideons to make sure the gospel goes to everyone throughout all the world. After all, that is our calling. That is our great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is a glorious gospel. Martin Luther said this. He said that the true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. The gospel is a precious treasure. Uh, Our greatest treasure is not the songs that we sing or the beautiful facilities that we have. Our greatest treasure is not the many ministries of Victory Baptist Church. Our greatest treasure is not necessarily our fellowship or our gathering together. Our greatest treasure is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us who we are. And that is our purpose. That is our reason for living. It is all all about the gospel. It is our true treasure. This morning, I want to share with you several things that we see concerning the glory of the gospel. First of all, if you notice in verse number 13, that the glory of the gospel is found in the preaching of the gospel. It is found in the preaching of the gospel. Verse 13, he says, for this cause, we also thank God without ceasing Because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, which you heard of us, the gospel is a powerful force. It is supernatural. Notice Paul goes on. He says that they received the word of God, that they heard of us. It was preached not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. We need to understand that the gospel does not come from man, but it comes from God. Someone has said that the gospel is not the kind of message that man would invent if he could, nor is it a message that he could even invent if he would. Romans chapter 1 verse number 16 tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said that when we preach Christ crucified, we have no reason to stammer or stutter or hesitate or apologize. There is nothing in the gospel of which we have any cause to be ashamed. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ, as Paul says, he is not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. Oh, we can talk about our ball teams. We can talk about uh, who won and who lost. And we could talk about all the things that we enjoy and all the things that mean so much to us. But my friend, there's one thing that we should never be ashamed of talking about. There is one thing that we should never stutter in. There is one thing that we should never be hesitant in. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God into salvation. It has the ability to literally turn a lot inside out. We should never shy away from preaching the gospel. The gospel is found, the glory of the gospel is found in the preaching of the gospel. And so therefore the preaching of the gospel must be paramount for it is the gospel that changes lives. It is the gospel that snatches an alcoholic from the clutches of addiction. 
It is the gospel that calms the spirit of the man that is overcome by anger. It is the gospel that frees a man from the entrapment of pornography. It is the gospel that restores a broken marriage. It is the gospel that cleanses the vilest sinner. It is the gospel that pulls you out of the muck and mire of sin and sets you on the rock of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that rescues you from the penalty of sin and pulls you away from the very flames of hell. It is the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ that redeems. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that justifies. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets you free. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Therefore, it must be preached. Amen. It must be preached in the marketplaces. It must be preached in the schools. It must be preached in the halls of, of government. It must be preached in the dark alleys. It must be preached on the ball fields and in the gyms. It must be preached in the hospitals. It must be preached in the jungles. It must be preached in the desert. It must be preached in the mountains. It must be preached on the beaches. Everywhere there are ears to hear, the gospel must be preached. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. And it is in the preaching of the gospel that God is glorified. You know, the doxological purpose of man is that God is glorified in everything that we do. We were created, we were made to bring him glory. Our purpose in life in everything that we do, whether we eat or drink, is to give him glory. And how is God glorified? God is glorified when a lost sinner is saved. God is glorified when a life is transformed. God is glorified when a people are gloriously changed. And how is a lost sinner saved? How is someone changed? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, everything that we do, church, should be centered on preaching Jesus. Every single thing that we do, every activity we have, Every event that we have, every ministry that we have, every project that we're involved in, it should be all about telling people about Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the only one that's going to change them. Amen? You know, I think it's important for us as a church that we reach out and we help those that are in need and that we partner with ministries such as our Baptist Disaster Relief in order to help those that have been affected by storms and disasters and all those different things. That is crucial. That is vitally important. But let me tell you something. The reason we do those things is not just simply to help people clean up from a storm or to help them to recover. Yes, they need that help, but that is not our ultimate purpose. Our ultimate purpose is that they would know Jesus. Amen? Because let me tell you something, Getting, having a new home built after a disaster is not going to save you from the flames of hell. Uh, ha- having water and food delivered to your doorstep in times of need is not going to save you from the flames of hell. The only thing that's going to save a soul from hell is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, everything that we do, whether it's disaster relief or food distribution, or going on a mission trip, or doing trunk or treat, or, or, or having a fellowship event, or a Sunday school class party, or whatever it is, everything that we do should be centered on one thing, and that's bringing people to Jesus. Amen? That's why we do what we do. That's why we are here. Why? Because God is glorified in the preaching of the gospel. There's another thing that we see concerning the glory of the gospel, and that is that the glory of the gospel is found in the receiving of the gospel. Notice he says again in verse 13, he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. You see, the glory of the gospel is found in the receiving of the gospel. Verse 13 speaks of how the Thessalonians received the gospel. They were convinced of its truth and they believed in it. Warren Wearsby said that may we never be confused as to the content and intent of the gospel. 
The gospel is not follow Christ and imitate his life, but receive Christ by faith and allow him to set you free. There is no place in the gospel for a salvation that is attained by keeping the law. You see, you cannot save yourself. You can never be good enough to get to heaven. There is no way you could ever work your way to salvation. Salvation is a free gift given to us by the grace of God. You see, God is not glorified in man's attempt to get to him because you see, that is what religion is. Religion is simply man's attempt to get to God. Religion will not save you. Religion will not lead you to God. It will only lead you to self-worship. However, all that needs to be done to secure your salvation was accomplished on the cross of Calvary. It's not about what you do in the church. It's not about your church membership. It's not about the good deeds that you do. It's not about the great works that you're involved in. The only way your salvation could be secured is through what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said that human nature's way of salvation is to do, do, do. But God's way of salvation is done, done, it's all done. Amen? You have but to rely by faith on the atonement which Christ accomplished on the cross. I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you're here today and you're contemplating salvation. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're not 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven. I would encourage you with this thought this morning, everything that needs to be done to secure your salvation has already been done. When Jesus cried, it is finished on the cross of Calvary. He said to Telestai, it is finished. The race has been won. It has been accomplished. In other words, the sins of the whole world has been paid for. Your sins, my friend, has already been paid for. And salvation has already been made available for you. Nothing else has to be done to secure your salvation other than... You simply accepting it and believing in it. That's all you have to do. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to do a list of do's and don'ts. You don't have to have religion. You don't have to have any of those things. All you need to do is to say yes to Jesus. The scripture says that whosoever calls upon his name shall be saved. It's pretty simple. Let me tell you something. If, if it's not all about the cross and we make it about us, then what's going to happen? We're going to miserably fail because there's no way that you can ever attain salvation on your own. And so therefore, it must be all about the cross. It must be all about the gospel. It must be all about what Jesus has done for us. And so therefore, we must accept it. We must receive it. We must put our faith in Christ alone. Why? Because he is the only way. Church, there is no greater joy than to see a lost sinner come to faith in Christ. Amen? And every time a soul is saved, the heavenly choir rejoices. God is glorified when the gospel is not just preached, but is also received. I ask you this morning, have you received the gospel? Not do you have religion, but do you have Jesus? Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus? You see, the glory of the gospel is found in the receiving of the gospel. But then notice also in verse number 13 that the glory of the gospel is not only found in the preaching of the gospel and the receiving of the gospel, but also in the sanctification of the believer. Notice he says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now look at this, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. You see, the gospel is not something that you graduate from. The gospel changes everything. It changes your whole life. We are not called just to know the gospel, but we are also called to live the gospel. And so therefore, this continuing in the gospel is what we refer to as progressive sanctification. It is you and I as believers in Christ progressively growing to become more like Jesus. 
going deeper into the gospel and allowing the gospel to transform every part of our life. The goal of sanctification is Christ likeness. That is the ultimate goal for you and I as believers in Christ is that we would be like him. And so you see the gospel touches every facet of our lives. If you've been saved and gloriously changed by the gospel, you need to also live out the gospel, which means that every area of your life is affected by it. You see, the problem is with a lot of believers today, they think the gospel is just simply getting their fire insurance. You know, it's just being saved from hell and that's it. And so they sort of compartmentalize their lives. And so in other words, uh, they they have their, their life at work over here. They have their life at home over here. They have their life in their their hobbies and the things that they enjoy over here. And then somewhere over here, they put their relationship with Jesus as if it is just one of many different facets of our lives. Let me tell you something. If you are a born again believer, your relationship with Jesus is not to be just one certain facet of your life. Instead, it's to be your whole life. Amen. Everything is to be wrapped up in your relationship with Jesus. Why? Because gospel living affects everything. Our career choices, our relationships, our finances, it's all affected by our sanctification. And for example, in light of the gospel, should we buy that new car? Maybe you're going out this week and you're thinking, man, it's about time for me to get a new car. I'm going to trade in the one I have and I'm going to go get a new car and I'm going to get a, a new car payment of, you know, four or $500 a month and, and tie myself to more debt because I've got to have this new car. I ask you this morning, in the light of the gospel, is that the right decision to make? In the light of the gospel, should you buy that car? In the light of the gospel, should I marry that person? Is it someone that honors the Lord? Is it someone that is a strong believer? The Bible says to be not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Let me tell you something. It is a sin. It is wrong for you. Young people, hear me out this morning. The very first question you should ask somebody when you're considering dating someone is to ask them, hey, tell me your testimony. Tell me about how you know Christ. Tell me when you came to know Jesus as their Savior. If they're not a Christian, if they're not saved, then you get away from them. Amen? Because the Bible says not to be unequally yoked. In the light of the gospel, you should ask yourself, should I marry that person? In the light of the gospel, should I take that job? Is it a job that's going to cause me to do things? That, that, that is not good uh, uh, character or integrity is going to cause me to do things that are, that are wrong or dishonest or sinful. Then, then maybe you need to think twice about whether or not you should take that job. Let me tell you something. It's not just about making more money because your job is not just to make money to, to take care of things. Your job is a mission field. And everywhere you go, let me tell you something, everywhere you go, you are a missionary. You are being sent out to be missional, to reach people for Jesus. And so wherever you work and whatever you do throughout the week, that is your mission field. You know, one of the things I would love for us to do as a church, you know, last Sunday we commissioned our our mission team. We prayed over them, laid hands on them, prayed for them as they're heading out to Guatemala to serve this week. One thing I would love for us to do every now and then is to have a, uh, have, have some type of commissioning service for those who are entering into new employment. And so we would love to do that for you. And so you come to us, you let us know, hey, if you're starting a new job, if you, if you're, or maybe you got a promotion or whatever it may be, and you're starting in a new position, I don't care what it is, whether it's working at a, at a factory or working at a school or working at a store or whatever it may be, and you've got a new job, you come tell one of your pastors and we'll take a moment in a, in a church service and we'll call you up and we'll lay hands on you as a missionary of Victory Baptist Church going to that place of employment. You see, that's, that should be our mindset. That should be the way that we live. Our entire lives is missional. It's not just about being a missionary and going to a foreign field. It's not just about teaching a Sunday school class or doing something in the church. But everywhere that we go, should, our entire lives should be wrapped up in living out the gospel everywhere that we go. And everywhere that we go, we are missionaries to that field that God has called us. And so in light of the gospel... 
when, when, you're, when you're about to make a decision about a job or whatever it may be, ask yourself, in light of the gospel, is this the right job for me? You see, for the believer, everything we do is in the light of the gospel. The word of God is working in us for his glory. Therefore, the glory of the gospel is found in our sanctification. We are to not only know the gospel and believe the gospel, but we're also to live out the gospel in our daily lives. The glory of the gospel is found in the believer's sanctification. But then notice a fourth thing we see in verses 14 through 16, and that is the glory of the gospel is also found in the suffering of the believer. The glory of the gospel is found in the suffering of the believer. Verse 14 through 16, he says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. You see, the Thessalonians had suffered the same things at the hands of their countrymen, as the Judean churches had endured at the hands of unbelieving Jews. And just as these Jews had made life hard for the young churches in Judea, opponents to the church of Thessalonica had oppressed the church there as well. You know, as we see here, Paul mentions that your own countrymen, the Jews, they killed the Lord Jesus, they killed their prophets, And now they are persecuting us who are faithful to preach the gospel and have forbidden us from bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. It is a sad but true fact that much of the opposition to the church comes from our own countrymen. Think about that. Much of the opposition from the church for against the church is not from those without the church. It's not from the lost world that is around us, but most of the hindrances and the opposition against the church often comes from their own countrymen, from their own people. The scripture tells us this. Now, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. You know, sometimes in order for us as a church to stay focused on our mission, in order for for us to stay focused on what God has called us to do, in order for us to make it all about the gospel. Sometimes we've got to, 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 to give people over to the Lord because sometimes when we give people attention, it only adds ammunition to their attacks. And so therefore, we must have an unwavering focus that outlasts any attacks that comes our way. When they ridicule you, hold on to the gospel and press on. When they spread lies about you, hold on to the gospel and press on. When they run your name through the mud, hold on to the gospel and press on. When they spread misinformation to get their way, hold on to the gospel and press on. When they sow discord and remember that what they are doing is an abomination to God and he will avenge you. So hold on to the gospel and press on. When Satan raises his ugly head, you raise up the standard of God's word and hold on to the gospel and press on. Don't let them pull you into an argument. Just hold on to the gospel and press on. My friend, the gospel of Jesus Christ always prevails. And when you're on, you are on the side of the gospel, then you cannot lose. Amen. I ask you this morning, are you on the side of the gospel? Are you on the side of the mission? Are you on the side of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world? If you are, then that's what you're going to live for. You're not going to live to win an argument. 
You're not going to live to get your own way. You're not going to live to, 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 to win a, a certain battle between you and someone else. Instead, you're going to live in order to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. You are to not just know the gospel, but live the gospel because it affects everything that is about you. And when you are persecuted and when there is opposition that comes against you, you stand strong and you hold on to the gospel because that is what matters most. Notice in the conclusion of chapter 2, Paul says this. He says, But you, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Paul wanted to come back to the church at Thessalonica so that he can encourage them, so that he can strengthen them. But notice in verse number 18, he says, We would come to you, but once again we were hindered. They were, he was hindered by persecution and attacks. And so he wasn't able to, to get to Thessalonica at that time. But notice what he encourages them with in verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming for ye are our glory and joy. Let me tell you something, the glory and the joy of the church is the lost sinners that we reach. The the glory and joy of the church is the disciples that are being developed. The glory and the joy of the church is the believers, the saints, that are being equipped for the work of the ministry and being sent out on mission. That is our glory. That is our joy. And that must be the thing that we focus on more than anything else. You see, Paul rejoices for the relationship that he had with the Thessalonians. And he looked forward to the day that he would see them again. And he says, "I, I long to see you again this side of heaven. But he says, if I don't see you again, I want you to know that you are my glory and my joy. Why? Because you, you are my children in the Lord. You are people that, that I reached with the gospel. You are people that I led to the Lord and have taught and have trained. He says, you're my glory and my joy. And he says, I look forward to that day. If I don't see you again in this life, I look forward to that day when I see you in glory. Amen. And we're in the presence of Jesus because he says, for you, our glory and joy. Let me tell you something. Our glory and joy is not how many people we necessarily fit in this building, but it's how many people we take with us to glory. Amen. The, 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 the greatest thing that we will ever experience is when we are in heaven and people come up and walk up to you and say, hey, I just want to thank you because you, your life had such an impact on me. It was because of your testimony that I came to know Christ as my Savior. That is the greatest thing. That is the greatest reward. So Paul says he looked forward to that day when he would see them again. As my grandmother-in-law would often say, I'll see you again here, there, or in the air. Amen? The glory of the gospel will always be our shining crown. Amen? That's what it's all about. I ask you this morning, church, what are you living for? Are you living for your own glory or your own personal gain? Or are you living for the gospel? Are you living for wealth and success in this life? Or are you investing in the kingdom of God? Do you you recognize your life as being a missional life? That everywhere that you go and the job that God has you in, that that is your mission field. Is that your mindset? Is that how you live? Is every decision you make based on the gospel of Jesus Christ? I pray that it is. Because you see, if our entire lives are centered around Jesus and the gospel rather than ourselves, then God can do some glorious things amongst us. And we will be like the Apostle Paul that will be able to say that you, Mount Juliet, You are our glory and joy because of our focus on the gospel. God has used us to bring you to Christ. Amen. And what a day that will be 
when we rejoice with those in heaven that we had an opportunity to reach with the gospel. Amen. I encourage you to stand this morning with your head bowed, your eyes closed. We'll have a time of invitation today. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your savior, I encourage you, why not trust in him today before it's too late? It's the best decision that you could ever make. The Bible teaches us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that sin separates us from God. It keeps us from having a relationship with him. It keeps us from an eternal home in heaven. But the good news is that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our road to hell, Jesus came down and bled and died on the cross of Calvary and paid the price of sin for you and for me. And the scripture says that whoever believes on the Lord Jesus shall be saved. You can have your sins forgiven and you can be given an eternal home in heaven. If you here today have never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you, I beg of you, won't you come and receive him here today? We have some folks that will be here in the front that would be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. In just a moment as we sing, we encourage you to come down the nearest aisle and we'll love to help you to know what it means to have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Child of God, I ask you this morning, what are you living for? I mean, you, you, you may know the gospel, you may be saved, you're on your way to heaven, but what are you living for? Are you living for the gospel? The only way that God can be glorified in and through your life is if you make the gospel the center of everything that you are and everything that you do. May we give him glory by glorying in the gospel, amen? because that's what it's all about. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your truth. And Father, we pray if there's anyone here today that is yet to trust in you as their Lord and Savior, may you convict them, draw them to yourself that they may be saved today. And Father, we pray that you would help us as a believer, as a church. Lord, help us to realize that we're not just to know the gospel, but we're to live the gospel. That every decision we make and everything that we do should be affected by our relationship with you. Help us to grow in the gospel. And Lord, help us to do everything we can to reach this city with the good news of Jesus Christ so that we too, as the Apostle Paul, can glory in the gospel. And we give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've been blessed by this week's message and invite you to join us soon in person on the Victory Campus. Worship schedules and other information can be found on our website at bbcmtj.org. Please visit it today. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.